Hi there, and welcome back to The Fuse Show. Uh, I'm your host, David Tran. I'm also the co-founder of Exfusion.io, and today I'm really happy to be joined by my guest, John Keister. He's a co-founder and CEO of MixMode, an AI-based cloud-native threat and anomaly detection platform for high-volume data feeds. He's also co-founded two search and analytics companies that grew to the 100 plus million in revenue mark and then went public. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. So I guess one of the questions I'd love to ask all of my guests is what led you to big build mix mode? Sure. Great question. Uh, you know, I was in the process of looking at a variety of opportunities and, uh, one of the areas of interest for me was, was cybersecurity and the growing interest in the large market. And, uh, I was doing some research on potentially starting something from scratch and, uh, had written a business plan around that. And then this opportunity came along to, uh, to lead a company that was, you know, already established in the market. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some benefits to, uh, sort of jumping into a company that has some customer traction. And, uh, we learned a lot from those early customers and, um, we were able to, you know, have a, a bunch of conversations to sort of, sort of figure out what the next wave of the strategy should look like. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that led us to, um, an, an AI focused strategy that we've been executing on over the last four years. So prior to mix mode, were you like, did you see this as a challenge in the industry or is this something like you feel like it's a new challenge in the industry and you want to tackle this up and coming problem? Yeah. You know, I, I did not come into mixed mode as a cybersecurity expert by any stretch. Okay. Um, you know, the, the previous technology companies that I was involved in, uh, we were in the primarily in the advertising technology space and, uh, you know, we had large engineering teams that had to, you know, focus on some of these cybersecurity aspects, but, uh, mm -hmm. we were not selling cybersecurity software. So I really came in as a, uh, you know, really as a novice and, um, as such, um, just started calling existing customers and prospects and advisors and people who knew a lot about the industry and tried to learn about where their pain points were, um, what they were happy with and not happy with, with existing vendors, um, and where their cybersecurity programs needed to go over the following couple of years. Mm -hmm. And what we what we found really is that there were two primary themes one was they were getting far too many false positive alerts and their mm -hmm. SOC teams were overwhelmed and secondly they knew that there was a very large number of threats that they were not able to see uh, within their network because of the limitations of rules-based systems and intel based systems mm -hmm. and they weren't sure where to go. So hmm. we were fortunate enough to, you know, meet a guy named Dr. Igor Mezik, who, uh, I had met prior to mix mode and is a world recognized AI expert. Um, I sat down with him, talked to him about some of the problems we were hearing from customers and asked him point blank, uh, if he thought that, uh, advanced AI, self-supervised AI was an approach that could potentially solve some of these problems. And long story short is we did a bunch of testing and we were able to find that uh, we could solve some of these problems with self-supervised AI. Hmm. And Igor came on board and we sort of redirected the company toward this mission of using innovative artificial intelligence to solve some of these big problems in cybersecurity. So, um, I would say, you know, kind of getting back to your question, you know, I got involved because I knew there was a lot of opportunity in cyber, but I didn't mm. particularly have the strategy sorted out until I talked to hundreds of customers about where their pain points were. And then it started to really, uh, it started to really come into focus. And then we started to build a team around, that focus. And, and thankfully we've been able to bring on a great team of both technologists and uh, business people to, uh, to run against that mission. So when, in the very beginning days, when you, you mentioned not being an expert 
in the domain, but I imagine you've become an expert through time. How did you overcome the massive amount of information overload of any new domain? Like, how did you, what is your thought process of breaking down a complex domain into some like absorbable bits and pieces that made it um, like, like a quick for, made it quick for you to learn? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think that what we really tried to do in those early conversations was let the customer speak hmm. and, you know, the data will set you free is, is one of my favorite quotes. Um, <laughs> you, you know, you, you can't rely on X, Y, Z opinion or, uh, you know, just reading things out of a book and hoping to find a mission that's going to resonate. Um, so really it was taking a lot of notes and a lot of, you know, elbow grease between mm -hmm. myself and, and the team around me that we, uh, listened to these customers, asked really hard questions asked why some of these other products were failing. And, you know, that's really what we did is that that's how our mission sort of came into, came into focus was uh, through those conversations and making sure that we understood the, the kind of highest level problems that they had and that we had a solution that was um, going to address those. So hopefully that's helpful, but, hmm. you know, I, again, I, I mean, I think, when when companies are getting off the ground, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of founders struggle with, hey, I'm sitting in a room looking at a blank piece of paper, and I and I need a mission, I need a strategy. I know I'm a, <laughs> you know, I know I'm a startup person, and you know, my recommendation to folks that are in that uh, in that realm is, it's great you got the passion, it's great you have the energy for it, it's great you have, you know, some general ideas, but you've got to talk to a lot of customers before you're going to feel real confidence around that strategy and, and, and get some traction. So I imagine that this is at least your third or fourth or fifth company at this point, or if not more, how did you choose to interview? Like I imagine all those hundred plus interviews take up a significant amount of time or some competing ideas that you had that like you might've like wanted to pursue as a company, but decided that mixed mode was the superior alternative. Oh, so which, which uh, areas within cybersecurity were we, were we, uh, thinking oh. about or, or even outside of that? Even outside of cybersecurity, like were there other business ideas that you were like toying around with in your head in the early days before you can sit, before you even interviewed the first few people for mixed mode that you were like trying to compare, do I build startup one or startup two in like different domains? Yeah. You know, I think the only other one that I took seriously was a, was a startup from scratch within cyber. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I wrote a business plan for that and I was sort of weighing that against hmm. mixed mode. So, you know, do I start with a completely blank slate and um, no customers and start from zero? Or do I start with a company that um, had some customers and had an existing platform and, um, you know, try to, you know, rebuild and re-energize, you know, that company. Yep, and sure. uh, I decided, you know, to go with the latter. Something I found really interesting is that a disproportionate number of the entrepreneurs on this show are actually focusing on cybersecurity companies. And I, I don't even look in any like cybersecurity specific sources to find these guests, but I notice a lot of them are building cybersecurity solutions. And I think a lot of them are roughly in the three to five year age range. What, what makes you think it's a growing industry? Well, I mean, the, the year over year spend in cyber continues to go up and to the right. So, uh, pe people are spending more and more money on, on cybersecurity. And, mm. uh, you know, unfortunately there's been more and more breaches every year and more and more data loss. And, um, so there's a lot of focus on the category. Um, obviously there's, you know, some huge themes out there around ransomware and around, you know, breaches that are, you know, really damaging companies, not just from a financial perspective, but from a PR perspective and from a, you know, losing trust of customers. And, you know, we think there's, you know, in, in, in many ways, cybersecurity is set up for a, a revolution. And the, the way that it has been done over the last 15 or 20 years uh, that is largely rules-based and largely based on looking at things that have happened in the past is to us only part of the solution and there has not been nearly enough you know hard work being done around predictive technologies and around the capability to see 
attacks and threats that do not have a signature and have never been seen before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the customers that we are talking to that have thought a lot about emerging threats and novel attacks, those are the ones that are really interested in talking to us because they realize that almost half the attacks that happen in any given year had never been seen before. Hmm. So you've, you've got to have that, you've got to have that capability. And we think it's still the first inning in, in the industry in terms of thinking about predictive technologies and seeing threats that have never, never happened before. So that's, what's exciting for us hmm. is it feels like it's just beginning in terms of that kind of technology. If you had to ballpark a percentage of call the fortune 500 companies, what percentage would you say of those companies are prepared as it relates to what you envision the future of cyber security and cyber like attacks to be? Like I said, I mean, I think, uh, companies at every stage, um, you know, s small businesses, medium mm -hmm. or, or even large fortune 500s, um, have historically really focused on, you know, threats that have happened in the past. So they take mm -hmm. intel intelligence feeds of, of attacks that have happened historically. And they say, okay, we got to watch for these things because they've happened before. Yeah. And that's great. That's, that's part of the problem. And that's absolutely something that should continue to be a part of somebody's program. But, uh, the fortune 500 do have the resources and the money and they're building machine learning teams to try to attack what I was describing, mm -hmm. uh, which is predictive technology and seeing attacks that don't have a signature and, and are not going to show up in an intelligence feed. But, um, like I said, I, th I think we're still in the first inning or second inning on, mm -hmm. on, on technologies like that being implemented at the fortune 500. Um, you know, some of the financial services companies are further along maybe than mm -hmm. others, but uh, we think it's a huge opportunity and it's going to be a, a very significant part of the investment for Fortune 500s over the next five, six years um, because AI is being used by the adversary and mm -hmm. uh, the technologies that the adversary is using are getting better and better and more sophisticated. And so novel attacks are not something that you can ignore. It's They're happening every single day. So if these attacks are novel and how does how does a software in, even with ai capabilities detect something that it's a like a novel day zero attack yeah it's a great question and um uh yeah i would love to uh, bring on maybe in a follow up uh interview we can bring on uh you know one of our our vp of engineering or our chief okay. scientist but i'll give you the you know at the highest level um, the reason that mixed modes AI is differentiated is that we're not bringing existing models to the table. We are not asking for historical training data. Mm -hmm. um, we are doing behavior analytics in real time um, and a network analysis to build a baseline of a specific network in real time so that we're not bringing bias into the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not bringing historical training data that may or may not be helpful as, as these networks evolve. Um, you're going to need to have something that can learn in real time and supervise itself. And that's really what the differentiator is for mixed mode. So when mm. we're building that model in real time and it's evolving in real time, we call it generative AI. Uh, what happens is when we see something that is outside of the norm of what we think should happen in the next five minutes or the next hour, mm -hmm. we will flag that as anomalous because we say, Hey, that's not something that should be happening on your network based on the baseline that we've built over the last number of days and weeks. So you need to take a look at this. Mm -hmm. And the way that most models work is they will say, Oh, X, Y, Z threat occurred. Uh, on a different network at a different time. And now we're seeing it on your network. So you need to go focus on that. Hmm. But if something outside of that realm occurs that hasn't been seen before, a lot of these other systems simply can't address that and certainly not in real time. So I guess the challenge of that is always the balance between the false negatives and false positives. How right. do you, I guess, eliminate that if you don't use historical information? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and again, I'll, I'll probably do an okay job of explaining it to the uh, the general user. But um, 
you know, I'm not a, I'm not a CS major, but I'll, what I'll say is our team does a really great job of thinking about what that, what, what that ideal point is of being sensitive enough to see the anomalies that should be focused on. Um, but we also don't tune it too far to the point where, uh, we're not surfacing things that should be looked at. So there's a, there's a, there's sort of a balancing act between, uh, making sure that you're surfacing things that should be looked at and, and making sure that you're also eliminating as many false positives as possible. And as the, as a user perspective of mixed mode, let's say I was, um, I don't know, running security for a, like a certain company. And would I be like notified of all these anomalies and it'd be on me to look into them? Is that how it typically works? So yes, typically, you know, we are not a service provider per se. Mm -hmm. uh, we do partner with a number of managed security services providers and uh, what we can do for a given client and what we do do for certain clients is uh, they enable the mixed mode software and they utilize that for their needs in terms of a SIM or a Yuba platform or an NDA platform, uh, sorry, NDR or NTA platform. And if they need services on top of that, we will refer them to one of our MSSP partners uh, gotcha. for monitoring or for, you know, hands-on services and support. Um, but we primarily are focused on being an, an AI-driven software company. So taking a step back, how do you think the AI companies can be doing a better job as it like relates to marketing AI? Because I think AI encapsulates so many things that from a consumer standpoint, the buzzwords can get out of hand sometimes. And sometimes companies are underselling the solutions they're providing at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. And we talk about it a lot internally. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of companies out there that are claiming to be artificial intelligence companies that really at the end of the day are rules-based system that, that aren't doing a lot of thinking. Right. Um, and that's problematic because over the last five, 10 years, you know, a lot of the customers we talk to, you know, have, have been jaded a bit by a lot of false promises. And so that's an opportunity for us because when we go in and we do a proof of concept and they can see that we can, plug in and go, um, that's, that's a really great, uh, opportunity for us to show our differentiation. But, mm -hmm. um, you, I mean, you've hit the nail on the head. The, the problem is that it, it has gotten very muddy so that, you know, folks that are in the neural network world, folks that are in the, the rules-based systems world, um, are in our mind solutions that, are not going to address some of these fundamental problems around zero day threats and novel threats, but they position themselves as being able to do so. So customers end up wasting a lot of time thinking they're going to get X, Y, Z, and they go through a POC or, you know, a trial mm -hmm. uh, with, with some of these, with some of these uh, vendors and they end up not getting what they want. And unfortunately it sort of paints a brush over uh, companies that are doing something really unique with AI um, and they sort of want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but there is absolutely, uh, you know, some great companies and technologies and people out there that are working on solving these kinds of problems. And, you know, hopefully over time as some of the leading companies embrace uh, AI that can make a difference uh, such as what mixed modes offering that I think, you know, th there will be leaders in this space and thought leaders in this space that kind of drag the rest of the industry along. Hmm. So when you think about the way that you and your team sell mixed mode, what are some of the value props you try to go with that help you stand out compared to the comparatively to these, I guess, AI companies that or companies that claim to have AI solutions that are not necessarily comprehensive? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, we, we, we tend to really focus on the fact that uh, the pain points with a lot of other AI companies are that they require a lot of data. And that can sometimes mean 
six to 12 months or even mm. longer. We've heard up to two years in some cases mm. of ingesting training data, building models, making the connections with all the various places in a customer's network that they need to pull data from in order to, uh, in order to get up and running. And then there's the pain point that a lot of other companies don't want to talk about around needing to update the, these AI models periodically mm -hmm. and how to deal with things like bias. So mm -hmm. really the proof is in the pudding with us. Once, once somebody gets into a, once somebody commits to a trial, we can get somebody up and running in less than a day Mm -hmm. and we can show them results within 24 hours. And they can see with their own eyes how the AI is learning the network and reducing the number of alerts they're seeing every day and surfacing things that they really care about. Mm -hmm. um, because as you know, I mean, you can, as a, as a sales team, you can talk till you're blue in the face about how you're different, but until the customer <laughs> can actually see it and live it, um, that's really what turns the corner for folks. So we really encourage people to to try it because it is very, very painless. It's software mm -hmm. only. We're not shipping appliances. We're not yeah. re requiring people to do a lot of a lot of work. I mean, they're they're literally in, in some cases up in less than a couple hours, mm -hmm. and they're seeing results the next day. So, um, you know, for us, that's the that's the primary uh, that's the primary strategy. Really, is to get people to try it um, because once they do. Um, we've had a very, very high success rate. And are, for these trials, is it purely uh, like touchless from your team in the sense that the software handles all of the um, the initial setup as well as like, I guess, building out a data set as well as giving a like, I don't know, regularly updating report? Yes. So, uh, you know, we typically work with, you know, one person on the networking team at the customer. Uh, they can be up in less than mm -hmm. an hour and, uh, then they've got access to the UI immediately. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're usually starting conversations with the customer the next day to walk them through the platform, help them understand the differentiators, uh, help them understand, you know, how those alerts are uh, being surfaced and why they're being surfaced. Mm -hmm. And so the, the ROI and the value is immediate. You know, the, the problem with a lot of cybersecurity investments and, and trials is that, you know, large companies are looking at sometimes six to 12 month installation processes okay. and teams of consultants having to come in and configure systems and get access to data. And it's a huge burden hmm. on, on the enterprise to actually even just go through a trial. And hmm. so, and, and then at the end of the day, if you're not getting a lot of value, you feel like, oh man, I just wasted a year and I put my team through a torturous process and we're not seeing the ROI. Hmm. So um, that, that's, you know, that's another real problem, you know, with this industry is that we're not able to deliver value fast enough in a lot of cases. Um, and that tires out the, the enterprises that we're trying to sell to. So we're trying to make that really frictionless and, you know, with, with no money up front and with no, uh, real commitment of time and resources, you're up in an hour. And that, uh, that sometimes is shocking to the enterprise <laughs> customer. Uh, they say that's too good to be true. Well, okay, that's fine. It, you know, it, it's fine if you don't believe us, but you know, talk to us on, on day one when it's actually up and running and delivering value. And then, you know, you, the proof will be in the pudding. So mm. um, that's, you know, that's really our strategy in terms of, you know, trying to position something that's going to be easy to use trying to position something that they can see the value very quickly. Mm -hmm. And if it's not a fit, they can make that decision quickly too. And sometimes, you know, a quick yes or a quick no is, is the best way to operate and, mm -hmm. and also make sure that the customer feels like they're using their resources in the right way to make decisions on, on innovation. Um, because if they have to invest a year of their time to decide if something's innovative, right. that to me just seems completely broken. <laughs> So when it comes to, you're, you're mentioning reasons why people would not want to move forward with the solution after giving it like a, like a chance. Like what are some reasons that people like would choose to like walk away from mix mode? Well, thankfully there hasn't been a lot of those, 
a lot of those situations, but, uh, you know, we're certainly not perfect and we're not going to be a perfect fit for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there was a case last year where we had a customer that thought they had the budget nailed down and thought they had the funding nailed down from, uh, from the higher ups that were making those decisions. And we went through the POC process. They loved the product. They wanted to move forward and the budget got pulled. I see. Um, so, you know, in enterprise sales, those things are going to happen. And that's why mm-hmm. you need a, a rich pipeline of, you know, dozens and dozens of accounts because, you know, sometimes those things are going to happen. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't recall a, a POC that we've been involved in, a trial that I, we've been involved in where, you know, at the end of the trial, they said, you know, your AI did not deliver what you said it was going to deliver. Mm-hmm. So that gives a lot of confidence to our team internally that, you know, we're working on the right things. We're solving the right problems. We're thinking about the customer and what their pain points are. And, uh, so it really is one of the, one of the more fun things that we do Mm. at this company is going through a trial process with a customer because we learn a lot. Hopefully they learn a few things. It's Mm -hmm. a very, it's a very frictionless and painless process for them to get some value. And, uh, So that's really where, you know, where we thrive and where we, you know, spend a lot of energy because we want to put that customer first and make sure that mixed mode can really help advance their security posture. Is enterprise the primary domain you're trying to grow within, or are you also trying to go across the entire spectrum of business sizes? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say we focus primarily on, on large enterprise, uh, and we also spend a lot of time with our channel partners, whether those are resellers, whether those are managed security services providers. Um, and there's the reason we like to work with, with channel partners is that they have a ton of relationships. They know the players, they know when the budgets are going to come up and, and they also have an existing, you know, existing base of customers. So mm-hmm. our preference is always to work through the channel and, uh, we've done a good job over the last year as we've kind of built out our own channel strategy to focus on, on, on customers and partners that want to, you know, put mixed mode in the forefront of sort of their innovation message. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to continue to invest in that because when you talk about the spectrum of customers that are out there for us, um, we think it makes the most sense for us to work through channels, certainly for the, mid market and smaller and smaller customers. But even on the enterprise, uh, we tend to, we tend to work with channel, uh, in large part because that's what our customers want as well. Were you working with it? Was it your intent to work with channel partners since day one, or is that something that evolved over time? Yeah. Ever since I showed up, we've had uh, a number of channel partners that have been productive and helpful. And, Mm. uh, we, have always had that as a focus and um, we're looking forward to over the next year, doubling down on that and adding more people to our channel team and uh, really making that the, the primary aspect of our go to market. So I recognize you're a few years into uh, building mixed mode now, but do you remember what the MVP was and what, what was in scope and was out of scope compared to where it is today? Yeah, I mean, in a general sense, you know, when we first started to, uh, you know, build out our strategy around AI first, um, we, you know, the first iteration, we sort of had AI in the background. It was sort of the brains behind the UI that uh, was essentially focused on network traffic. And where we are now is... Um, the AI is really in the forefront. We're, we're showing people what the AI is thinking about as a priority for that security team to look at. And we're doing that across any da- any timestamp data uh, that the customer wants us to analyze. And so that could primarily where we're focusing now is, is on public cloud data. So whether that's AWS or Azure or Google cloud or Oracle, um, we're, we're able to process that and show anomalous behavior that folks should be looking at. And 
Um, as Gartner pointed out recently in a report, there's unfortunately not a lot of great solutions out there for looking at anomalies in public cloud data. So we're finding a very receptive audience there, and we're going to hmm. continue to push that message and focus on that. Um, and we can also, uh, you know, manage manage the corporate on-premise network data for folks as well. But uh, cloud is is where the big emphasis and and the and sort of the area of most investment for us at this point. Hmm. Do you remember how long it took to build the MVP? Well, probably the first iteration took uh, about 12 to 15 months. And then okay. the second iteration was another nine to 12 months on top of that to kind of mm-hmm. really go all in on AI first. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that true AI first product uh, came to market mid last year. Gotcha. And then, so I, I've worked on some anomaly detection systems in the past. And I think one of the questions that came to mind was, was having a system that didn't require rules and tuning, like a required feature from early days, or was it something that came as a feature request later on? That was really uh, core to the algorithm that uh, that Mixed Mode has built into the platform. So mm-hmm. that's the way that it works. That was not a feature request per se. Um, it was something that we, you know, we learned about a pain point from the customer of, Hey, writing all these rules and hiring more and more analysts to write rules is like a dog chasing the bumper. You're never going to get there. There's so many rules you would have to write in order to uh, address every novel attack that could possibly come your way, that it's a fool's errand. It's just Mm -hmm. never going to happen. And so, you know, the more sophisticated customers that we would talk to would say, Hey, that's really where we need help is we don't yeah. want to write rules anymore. And, and we said, Hey, well, guess what? That's the way our algorithm works. Um, hmm. So that was sort of a happy coincidence, but again, it was based on a lot of research and conversations with these customers and what they're, what they're after. Another question I had for you is what were some of the threats that you've seen only more recently that you didn't think you saw or that didn't exist prior to like call it like prior to COVID? Um, you know, I'd have to bring on our technical team to kind of get in the weeds on that. Okay. But, uh, you know, I think in, in general, what I'd say is that we are seeing more and more sophisticated attacks mm-hmm. and more and more attacks that are not just brute force. How many times can I try to, uh, how many times can I try to type in a password and get in? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, multi-stage, multi-step, uh, very long periods of time uh, to start and seed an attack before you actually let it go. And mm-hmm. that's that's the kind of thing that our more sophisticated customers test us on mm-hmm. is attacks like a man in the middle attack, mm-hmm. um, attacks that happen over a very, very long period of time. Um, they want to just see how our our system reacts and can respond to things that will not show up in an intelligence feed. And we love those kind of tests uh, (laughs) because, you know, we're not using canned data. We are talking to the customer about real world problems that they're seeing and showing them how we address those. Hmm. And, uh, you know, when we get a customer that's that uh, locked in on understanding why novel attacks are a problem, we tend to do very well. And we know there's alignment because they're trying to solve something that we are built for. Hmm. Can you walk me through what the day in the life of a CEO of mixed mode looks like? Um, well, you know, we're an early stage company, so, you know, I tend to introduce myself as the CEO and the janitor. (laughs) Um, and, you know, that, and that really applies to everyone at our company. We're, you know, we're an early stage company where we really, um, you know, focus on bringing on great people that um, are, you know, dyed in the wool early stage folks. They want to wear a lot of hats. They mm-hmm. want to help customers. They're used to going from, you know, a trial call with a customer into a product meeting, into an engineering meeting, into a sales meeting, and they can 
sort of float between all those things and play the appropriate role um, in all those aspects. And that's why I guess I feel really fortunate to have the mm-hmm. team that we have because everybody wants to help the customer. Everybody wants to see trials go really well. Everyone wants to make sure we're you know focused on the right product iterations to mm-hmm. take the next step forward. Um, so, you know, it's exciting, you know, right now I'd say as we're getting toward the end of the year and kind of wrapping up the contracts that are in motion, um, you know, as a group, we're starting to turn our attention toward planning for next year and, you know, how does this organization evolve so that we can handle a lot more customers and that we can handle a lot more bandwidth and a lot more mm-hmm. records from cloud data and, continue to scale the way that we've scaled in the last year. And um, we definitely are, you know, absolute believers that the people drive the business Mm -hmm. and uh, great teams win over great products. So we're very, very focused um, right now on adding A plus players to this team so that we can execute well on the business we have in front of us and continue to grow. How'd you build up call it the first 10 employees and how have you been, I guess, scaling since? Um, you know, I, I think what, what I've found historically in, in co-founding companies or getting in early stage is, you know, the first, you know, 10 or 15 people are probably coming from your Rolodex and, you know, people that you've worked with in the past or have known mm-hmm. in the past. And this one was no different. You know, we, you know, sat down with the people that were here when I started. And, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, who are the A plus players that, you know, and, uh, we're still in that stage right now, actually. Mm Um, you know, I met with somebody this morning that was, that knows two of the people at our company. And, uh, Hmm. that's, that's sort of where we are now is, you know, it's always nice to hire from within the network of people that, you know, at the company, because, um, they've got work experience with that person. They know what their level of emotional intelligence is and are they going to be fun to work with? And are they going to bring the culture that you're trying to build? Um, so that, that's kind of historically where we've been. And then you get to a certain size and, and growth rate where that becomes a little bit tougher and you're going to have to go, you know, and, and push from the outside a little bit and, uh, and make some bets. But, uh, you know, hopefully over the next year, it'll be a mix of, you know, leveraging the contacts that our team has already, plus, uh, you know, bringing in some, some outside talent. So when it comes to culture at your company, what are some of the words you can use to describe it? I would say, uh, that, you know, we really try to put our people first and, you know, that means making sure that they're set up for success and that they're working on the areas of the business that they want to work on. Um, we, uh, from a product perspective, uh, the customer data is at the center of everything that we do. Mm-hmm. Um, we try to stay away from, you know, ivory tower, <laughs> speeches about what the product should do and why. Um, and we really try to focus on, okay, this customer said this, and that's why that's going to be a principle that we're going to think about going forward. Mm. Um, and it's a very, it's a very freeing concept when you do that, because uh, as we've all seen in companies, uh, sometimes people have differing opinions and right when the customer data and the customer feedback is at the center of every conversation that tends to get everybody aligned and get everybody thinking about uh, the problems and the solutions in the same way. And it's a very freeing thing. Um, it becomes much less about who's in what camp because we're all in the same camp. Hmm. Do you have, what are some of those principles that you've drawn from com- conversations around customer like onboardings or data? I'm sorry. Can you, can you restate that? Oh yeah. So you you were talking about how uh, you've had uh, some internal team discussions about um, some customer data and those help you draw principles that you carry forward. Some, what are some of those principles? Yeah. I mean, some of this is repetitive. I apologize, but you know, going back to when we, you know, when we were first getting started um, 
and doing, you know, hundred, literally hundreds of interviews and conversations mm-hmm. and prospecting calls, um, we would ask them, you know, what is your primary pain point and mm-hmm. where, where do you, where do you want to see your security program a year from now? And, you know, in those early days, like I said, there was kind of two main themes that we heard. Uh, you know, one was we're getting completely overwhelmed with false positive alerts and our security team can't handle it. So they end up going through things by hand and it's a manual process and it's brutal. And then the other main pain point that stood out to us was this issue of novel, novel attacks. And, um, so those have definitely been two of the primary points of feedback that have really led our mission over the last couple of years. Gotcha. Um, now there's some more, uh, you know, things that we l- have learned along the way that have added to that. But uh, as a primary, you know, as a primary mission statement, we kind of talk about, you know, three things that we're going after and it's, it's efficiency. Um, and again, that sort of ties back to that false positive, false mm-hmm. positive alert problem. Uh, there's innovation. Um, and that ties back to the novel attacks issue, uh, because you need innovation to deliver against that. And then the third pillar of what we really focus on is scalability. And Mm. our engineering team has done a fantastic job over the last years. We've grown, uh, by many, many multiples to be able to scale for existing customers and, you know, for the public cloud data that we're, we're now handling. So, um, that's really helped us. Uh, you know, deliver a concise and clear message on our North Star to our team. And, uh, you know, having those three pillars and also having that customer feedback has really helped us drive forward and do it clearly and um, ignore the noise, which is really, really hard to do in any industry. Um, it was funny kind of early on when I when I joined this company, uh, you know, I talked to a few folks that, said, hey, you know what? I don't know why you're getting into cybersecurity because it's a really noisy space. <laughs> and, um, you know, I and, I and I said to them, hey, uh, I get it, but name me an industry that is growing fast with a lot of momentum, a lot of opportunity, and, and really a Wild West uh, sort of aspect to it with a ton of investment mm-hmm. that doesn't have noise. <laughs> and so, um, and you know, having spent 20 years in, in technology and in, in, in other industries, um, that was always the case. So I, I think that's one of the really interesting things about, you know, being in an early stage company for me. And I think a lot of the people that work with me at, at mix mode is hmm. it's a, it's an ongoing critical thinking and problem solving uh, issue that you're, you're really going after every single day. And if you read every press release and you get concerned about <laughs> you know, the, the big players doing X or Y, um, and, oh, how can you compete against this big company or that public company? You know, you can drive yourself nuts. But if you, mm-hmm. if you, if you really, you know, focus in on, Hey, these are the two problems we're going to try to solve for customers and it's resonating. Let's just stick to our knitting and make sure we deliver against that. Mm-hmm. It can be really rewarding. And, uh, it can also help you focus really well because we're not going to be all things to all people, but right. if, if you can hone in on a couple of, of big problems and address those with really innovative technology, um, you can find, you know, product market fit and you can move your, move your business forward. At what stage of your career were those thoughts that you just share with me right now, things that became more solidified? Man, I, you know, I think, uh, Every single day, I'm learning a lot, and uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I I've certainly learned from a lot of great and smart people over the years. Um, and you know, I do keep a notebook on you know some of the things that are sort of you know principles I have to kind of go back to and mm. read some of the same books over and over again. But uh, you know, at at the end of the day, it's I think it's really about you know, hiring great people, getting them behind a mission and staying true to those themes and, and letting customer feedback drive your strategy forward. And if you, if you can do that, 
you're going to have a lot of success. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen a lot of founders, you know, trip up, um, because they're, they want to be the person who has all the answers and they want to be the person who, Hey, I have this vision and I'm going to go execute it. Okay. Well, if you don't test that against your customer base, (laughs) you're going to, you know, you're going to have a very painful journey. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's probably the one thing I've learned over time that is, has driven me more than anything is make sure that, uh, everybody in the company is touching the customer. So, you know, in a lot of companies, you know, the salespeople are the only people who ever call customers Mm -hmm. and that's fine. It works for some people, but you know, my sort of my approach is everybody should be on calls with the customer at some Mm -hmm. point, you know, engineers invite them in, um, people in ops finance, uh, it doesn't matter. Everybody should hear what the customer is talking about and thinking about because it helps your entire culture stay on top of what's important and why why things should be running the way they are. And it, it helps them learn about their own department or the mission as a whole and how it all fits together. And it leads to getting great ideas from all parts of the company because they're all hearing the customer and they're all going to interpret it a slightly different way. Hmm. Well, I have one last question for you, and that is that you mentioned some books that you like to revisit to, I guess, to reground yourself to principles. What are some of those books? You know, uh, the one that's probably at the foundation is Sun Tzu's Art of War. Hmm. Um, that's probably the one I read the most often. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, what I sort of take away from that one is that, you know, you've really got to be patient and think about, think about your, your partners, think about other customers, think about other people around you, um, before you approach, uh, you know, creating an alliance. And, um, that's something that I think, um, I've always encouraged my team members to read that book as well, Mm -hmm. because when you go into a partnership conversation, and you've already thought about it from the partner's perspective, you're going to be way ahead of the game. Cause unfortunately, uh, a lot of folks don't do it that way. Right. <laughs> you know, they, they walk into a customer and they say, okay, I got to get these five things done. And they try to pound that customer to death. <laughs> and, um, that leads to very, uh, very uneasy conversations. But, uh, if you're always thinking about it from their perspective and what they need to accomplish and how to make them really win, mm-hmm. um, that can lead to, you know, a great win-win relationship and, uh, a long-term partnership. And so that's probably, you know, if I was going to mention one, that's, that's, that's really the primary one. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time, John. Um, I just want to give you the stage now for the people following along this episode who want to follow you in your journey or to find out more about your company, where should they go? Great. So, yeah, uh, I think going to mixmode.ai is our, is our homepage. And, um, if anybody wants to reach out and, uh, have a conversation about the industry or anything else, any way that, you know, I or we can help, um, you know, the email, uh, is on the website as well, or, you know, shoot me a note on LinkedIn, but, uh, I really appreciate David, you taking the time and, and it's, you asked some great questions and hope we can continue the relationship. Sounds good. Well, thanks again for your time, John.